Good afternoon. Um, I'm Susan Gottesman, and I'm here on behalf of the Lambda Lunch Interest Group, of whom I see many members out there. But if you don't know what it is, it's the sort of prokaryotic interest group at NIH, and we meet uh, every week. And we, we nominate for walls, and we're very delighted that, that, that this year, um, this Wednesday afternoon lecture is John Michelanos. It's the last one for uh, 2014. So this is a great way to finish up the year. Um, John has been a, a real leader in, uh, in the field of bacterial pathogenesis for, for many years. Um, his work combines almost everything, <laughs> I think, but a lot of really wonderful novel methodologies that have been uh, used widely by others for probing the infection process and uh, molecular studies, studies of uh, evolution, studies of um, everything you can think about, including uh, vaccine development. Um, and uh, we'll hear today about one, one aspect of that, uh, the, the understanding of a molecular ma machine that does some really interesting things. Um, much of his work has been on Vibrio, but that's, he also is broad in the, in the organisms he's been working on. Uh, in addition, I have the feeling that half the other bacterial pathogenesis people that we look to around the country trained with John, so he's had an influence well beyond um, his, own, his own lab. Um, and not surprisingly, he's received a long list of honors over the years. Um, he was elected to the National Academy in 1998. Um, he, uh, among the things on there, one of the methodologies was the, uh, uh, a method for looking at in vivo expression of genes from bacteria that turn out to be virulence factors, and that, that paper uh, was the, the outstanding paper of the year in science in 1993, so, um, and it goes on from there. So, John received his, his graduate and uh, his undergraduate and graduate education at UCLA, and I, I think he fell in love with Vibrio and pathogenesis then, and he kept working on it. He came to Harvard as a postdoctoral fellow, and as far as I can see, never really left. Um, uh, he was there maybe two and a half, three years as a postdoc, and someone recognized this was a star because he then became an assistant professor. He's moved up the, uh, up the academic ladder, and, and since 1996, he's chaired the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics at Harvard and he's the uh, Dell Lehman Professor um, in the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics. And I'll let him give his beautiful story on the extraordinary bacterial type six secretion machine. Well, thanks so much for that introduction, Susan. And um, thanks very much for coming to, to hear this story and for the invitation to, to give this uh, prestigious talk. So uh, sometimes when I write a, uh, a, a title like that, the Extraordinary Bacterial Type 6 Secretion Gene, it, it occurs to me that this might be sounding a little bit, uh, you know, arrogant or overstating what uh, I've come to believe uh, is in fact the case, and that's what I'm going to try to do today is tell you um, a bit about this machine, some historical uh, observations about the machine, put it in the context of maybe evolution a little bit to make that interesting, and then really talk about the mechanics uh, of the machine, which I think really make it um, kind of mind-boggling and extraordinary when you think about it, and, uh, and then finish up with a few other observations on what it might all mean in, in nature. So uh, I don't think it's a big surprise for this audience to know that uh, protein secretion by particularly gram-negative pathogens is one of the primary virulence properties of these organisms. Many different types of secretion systems have been uh, characterized uh, through the years. I think we're up to type 9 now. But suffice to say that these uh, do anything from secreting proteins to the extracellular milieu, like uh, the type 1 and type 2 secretion systems to introducing proteins and nucleic acids into target cells, uh, such as the famous type 3 and type 4 systems. Uh, and those, those entry pathways can include the cytosolic membrane or the vacuolar membrane. Um, as we look at this, uh, this 
history of secretion, we also recognize that these organelles have an evolutionary history to them. And I'm not so sure it's so easy to figure out who came first. So if you look at type 4 secretion systems, for example, uh, some of the earliest machines described were conjugative pili, but I'm not sure they started out as conjugative uh, machinery to move DNA. They may have started out as protein movers and then were adapted for DNA. Uh, likewise, uh, the type 2 system looks a lot like type 4 uh, pili or fimbri, and as it turns out, filamentous phage, and again, you could argue, is it a filamentous phage that was turned into the secretion system, or a secretion system was turned into a filamentous phage? And the basal body of flagella looks a lot like uh, the basal body of the type 3 secretion system, and one wonders which one of those came first. So. I think uh, we are stuck wondering about this, and I'm not sure there's ever going to be a, a complete resolution uh, to what the, the history of these structures are without um, many more uh, people interested in computational biology and evolutionary history of proteins getting into this field in a big way. Now, another thing that's interesting about the secretion systems is you can sort of build a Venn diagram where you can say, are these secretion systems more about eukaryotic host virulence or more about doing something to other bacterial targets? And, uh, or more about, for example, extracellular substrates and extracellular structures of host cells. And just, you know, without going in, uh, in great detail, I think we can say with some certainty that other than the flagellum, uh, the majority of the type 3 secretion systems that we know about are about uh, delivery of effector proteins into eukaryotic uh, cells. And likewise, the majority of the type 2 secretion systems we know about uh, generally secrete proteins uh, to the outside of bacterial cells, usually into the extracellular milieu, sometimes into the outer membrane. Uh, and some of these proteins that they secrete, like toxins, can be proteins that ultimately have a goal of hitting an intracellular target, but when they do so, they have to carry along with them a receptor binding domain, a translocation domain. The machine itself is incapable of delivering directly proteins into the cytosol of a target cell or into the membrane of a, of a target cell, be it eukaryotic or prokaryotic. So uh, what I want you to keep that in mind a bit today as we talk about type 6, because type 6 really falls more in this uh, central zone here where both eukaryotic and prokaryotic targets clearly have been part of its uh, evolutionary history. And based upon just pure housekeeping, I think prokaryotic targets right now seem to be trumping eukaryotic targets for this machine. That being said, though, the functionality of the machine really came from the work of Stefan Petaski uh, in my lab, at least in terms of the Vibrio cholera functionality and the canonical uh, characteristics of the machine. And he was actually studying uh, dictostelium discoidum as a model system. These amoeba eat bacteria. And uh, if you can see this OK, I think uh, you can see that wild type vir uh, virulent uh, vibrio cholera in this case will form a lawn. And when you put amoeba on that lawn, you don't get holes in the lawn. But he did a screen where he looked for any mutation that would allow amoeba to now grow and form these plaques. And among the various mutations he found were canonical substrates, a class of proteins called VGRGs, and this major secreted protein called HCP. And this really, this work uh, defining the gene cluster and showing that HCP was a secreted protein dependent on, on these uh, factors really got us going uh, in the type 6 field. And, and we recognized something was different about this system right away because some of these VGRG proteins, of which there were three in Vibrio collar, certainly looked like they were going to be effectors. I'll come back to that in a moment. But one thing that was also strange about them was they were uh, secreted by the secretion machine. If you knocked out, uh, for example, this uh, one of the components of the machine itself, they didn't end up in the supernatant. These are controls uh, for lysis. Uh, but the substrates that got into the supernatant, like HCP and VGRG proteins, here are two examples, were also dependent on VGRG proteins and HCP proteins, if you will, for their secretion. So we had a really weird secretion system that we knew right away was not typical of the normal secretion systems that people study, where the machinery could be easily separated, the machinery's functionality could be easily separated from uh, the effectors, and that not all effectors were required for secretion in the machine. Luckily, an explanation for that came out later as we started understanding the structure of the machine. And that really began with work of Joseph Mugeau now at the University of Washington in Seattle, 
who uh, characterized the HCP protein structure with collaborators and showed it to be uh, a hexameric ring structure that in crystals formed these tubes with these 40 angstrom channels. And when you're, you're studying a secretion machine and you see a, a channel and a tubular-like structure in a crystal, you sort of feel pretty confident that that channel is going to be something that affects uh, transit down, maybe a stable bridge, if you will, between a target cell and a eukaryotic cell. And to some extent, that conclusion is correct. Uh, uh, in fact, Joseph has data, which I'll come back to later, uh, to suggest that some effectors are indeed loaded into uh, that central channel. But as to whether they move in the sense of a, uh, of a protein subunit down uh, the tube of a type 3 secretion system or not seems uh, pretty unclear. It seems to be a less stable structure. Um, as for VGRG proteins, these proteins were, uh, like I said, identifiable as effectors because they had some domains that had been characterized before. This actin cross-linking domain, or ACD domain, was a toxin uh, A subunit, activity subunit, that was capable of cross-linking actin from monomeric actin to linear uh, uh, polymers of actin that effectively disrupt the cytoskeleton of, in particular, phagocytic cells. And indeed, uh, Amy Ma, a student in the lab, was able to show that type 6 positive cells generate uh, intense uh, inflammatory responses, and the inflammatory responses were characterized by a lot of uh, cells that had disrupted uh, cytoskeletons, and in fact, you could extract out of these disrupted rounded cells uh, cross-linked actin. So we had pretty clear evidence right from the get-go that not only was this an actin cross-linking uh, toxin, it actually was cross-linking actin in inflammatory cells in the context of infection. But if we looked at the other uh, carboxy terminal domains in the other two VGRGs, at least one of them, VGRG3, had a domain that was recognizable as minimally peptidoglycan, a peptidoglycan binding domain. Now, later on, when better uh, analytical programs were developed, uh, we recognize now that this domain not only contains a peptidoglycan motif, it also contains a lysozyme domain. But when we uh, published this in 2007, we recognized that there were a large number of VGRT-like proteins with extensions. Uh, some of them had uh, recognizable uh, toxin-like domains, like the actin cross-linking domain of the RTXA toxin, the ADP ribosyl transfer domain that ADP ribosylates actin. Uh, called VIP, but many of them are recognizable peptides, chitinases, uh, which may actually be lysozyme-like enzymes as well, uh, lipases, and putative adhesins. And we call these evolved uh, VGRGs um, to uh, distinguish them from uh, VGRGs that contained only these two conserved domains but not carboxy terminal extensions. And as noted on this slide, phage tail spike homologous regions uh, turned out to be, in fact, uh, what they were. Um, through uh, both biochemical, well, uh, bioinformatic analysis, structural analysis, and ultimately crystal structure analysis by our collaborator Peter, Peter Lehman in Lausanne, we were able to confirm that those two domains, a conserved and terminal uh, domain, uh, corresponded to uh, the GP27 uh, fold of uh, the uh, protein from lambda, from, uh, I'm sorry, T4 phage of E. coli. Um, there was an OB fold domain that sort of serves this collar-like structure, and then in between there was a, there typically is a second protein called GP5 in the lambda uh, spike structure, which uh, has fused to it a lysozyme domain, and in our, do in our structures uh, there was no lysozyme domain, but there was this G GP5 uh, beta helix. And uh, that suggested that uh, this structure indeed was forming a trimeric uh, structure, which was later confirmed first in part and then in whole, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out about this that is, is pretty cool is that while this is a trimer up here, uh, it turns out there's a duplicated domain in there called a, a beta tube domain, and those beta tube domains uh, were exactly the same fold as the, as the fold uh, caused by a hexameric uh, single domain of the HCP monomers. So effectively, what you could do is show that uh, these tubes that we knew could form in the crystals looked like they were going to stack up perfectly and fit like a you know, glove in a hand, if you will, with the uh, trimeric uh, spike structure if we could get such a structure to assemble. And I'm here today to tell you we still haven't been able to get that to assemble, 
but I feel we're getting closer all the time and uh, have uh, some other complexes that are starting to look encouraging. So, uh, and part of this is that you need those structures to, uh, to get some of these uh, more stable polymeric things to form, as I'll come to later. So, um, so this, was, this was sort of the model, and what was emerging was a recognition that there were other proteins that looked like they were phage-like. Uh, two proteins called VIP-A and VIP-B were characterized by uh, Moog's group uh, in this Bowman et al. Uh, paper and uh, were found to form tubular structures which uh, actually could be disassembled by a protein called CLIP-V, a AAA ATPase I'll come back to later. And when these uh, images were, uh, were published by uh, the Moog group, uh, Merrick Bassler in the lab uh, came in one day and said, that's the sheath. And it turns out T4 polysheaths have the same cogwheel, 12-member cogwheel-like structure with about the same dimensions. So we recognized that VIP-A and VIP-B were, in fact, sheath-like structures. So we went ahead and uh, came up with a hypothesis that VIP-A and VIP-B were forming a sheath, HCP was forming a tube. As it turns out, GP25 was clearly a base plate, very conserved base plate protein, and VGRG was uh, forming a spike. But the apparatus was inverted, if you will. So it was uh, likely that these components were all in the cytosol. There were other membrane components that phages didn't have. But mechanistically, a contractile phage mechanism was the most likely mechanism to explain the conservation of the components we knew about. Uh, con presumably contraction from an extended sheath to a contracted sheath would drive uh, the inner tube, as it does with, with uh, a phage, uh, out of the cell. Uh, with anything that's uh, attached to that tube, like a VGRG spike uh, following suit. Now, the surprise came when we found out that uh, these contracted structures were actually huge. And they're actually the target, in the end, of uh, the fusion uh, of GFP that ultimately uh, allowed us to visualize the cycling of the machine in real time. So here, uh, Merrick Bassler purified contracted sheaths. Uh, they were 10 times longer than phage sheets, about 500 nanometers in length. That's big enough that we could see them inside cells. We didn't have to worry about being the size of a pixel. So fluorescent microscopy was possible, and we collaborated with uh, uh, Grant Jensen's group on uh, electron cryotomography. So this is what uh, we were stunned to see when Merrick was able to look at uh, uh, real-time uh, uh, video microscopy, time-lapse video microscopy, in this particular case sped up 50 times. You see these structures uh, build from the side of the cell to the other end of the cell. Uh, typically, uh, the building process takes 20 to 40 seconds. There's a sudden uh, contraction event, right? I think this one will contract for us right about now, if I will, if I remember that one right. No, that one contracted first, and then that one goes. Um, and that contraction event caused the structure to reduce in size about uh, half. And what's amazing about uh, that contraction event is as soon as that contraction occurs, it's quite clear that the structure gets torn apart within uh, 20 or 40 seconds. And usually, uh, rate limiting is how fast that structure gets disassembled for building a new structure somewhere else in the cell, if you look at enough of the images. so. Uh, if you look at the contraction event here, right there, this is being shot at 200 frames per second. Literally, that contraction event occurs in one frame, which means in five milliseconds, the structure goes from about a half a micron to uh, a quarter of a micron in size when it's built across the, the length of the cell. So. Uh, Martin uh, Pilhofer in Grant's lab was able to generate uh, a lot of uh, cryo-electron tomography images. And if you can see this uh, in the lighting, there's a structure that you can see inside these frozen cells that is thin and long, typically the length or the width of the, of, uh, the Vibrio cholera cells. Sometimes there's some perturbation of the membrane where it connects up in a, a dome-like structure that we call the base plate. And, and we could usually see density also that transverse between cytoplasmic and outer membrane. There are another form of the structure that was, that was wider uh, and shorter, typically. And that structure, as it turned out, was empty. And a lot of the density that we could see that was associated with uh, the transmembrane uh, 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 
aspects of the structure uh, typically, typically were gone in these others. And we uh, thought these looked and measured uh, analogous to a contracted sheath, so we therefore called the thinner structure uh, extended sheath. And indeed, the extended sheath had density on the inside, which we assume minimally was an HCP tube, but perhaps effectors as well. And likewise, the contracted sheath was empty on the inside. So uh, this uh, beautiful animation by Don Casper that we borrowed was uh, able to depict more or less what was known for T4 phage. An extended sheath-like structure contracts to about half its size. You lose none of the protein complement of the sheath. It just simply turns and drops in ring by ring to produce these two transitions. It doesn't pump up and down like that. That's just a, that's just a loop. Um, but the amazing thing is that to resolve uh, this structure with that structure, if there are contacts in the inner tube with the outer sheath, and you probably would need those contacts to hold that tube and force it out of the cell during the contraction event, or into the cell if you were a phage, uh, it actually turns. And if you watch those, those uh, numbers at the top of the yellow tube, these are turning around. So that's a lot of speculation, but uh, as it turns out, um, as this says, the inner tube would turn 10 times for the length of the type, three, type 6 sheaths, and that calculates out to 120,000 RPM, which is quite a remarkable um, rotational acceleration that occurs within 5 milliseconds. So this was the model we, uh, we published when we got these images. We imagined that a base plate was the initial uh, building of the apparatus, VGRG spikes may lay the groundwork for uh, building uh, a structure that ultimately allowed the tube uh, to begin being built with HCP uh, hexamers, and ultimately a high energy state with uh, the VIP A and VIP B protein uh, would represent the extended structure. And then a contraction event occurs, and lots of people ask me what triggers the contraction event in phages. It's, it's a combination of factors, tail fiber engagement, base plate engagement. There may be some uh, uh, ability of some kind of a contact occurring outside of the structure that can trigger the contraction event, but when we image it, it seems to occur even in cells that are separated from uh, sister or other cells they're contacting. So, for the cells that we've characterized most, we think right now it looks more spontaneous uh, than induced, but the assembly actually might be controlled, or certainly is controlled in some organisms. So then finally, uh, this AAA ATPase called CLIP-V that Mar Moog's group uh, characterized uh, utilizes ATP to disassemble that contraction structure uh, by threading uh, typically one of the proteins, the, uh, the VIP-B protein, uh, through, the, um, through the central channel of this AAA ATPase. Now, if you watch uh, clip V labeled with red, you find out another remarkable thing about how the system's controlled. Uh, clip V is red and VIP A is green. Notice that there is no cross labeling of an extended VIP A structure. This is the extended before the contraction. You see no red up here. But as soon as these structures uh, begin contracting, suddenly a spot appears of clip uh, V. If you can see color green and red uh, nicely, you can watch it over here, but this just uh, shows you the correspondence. So by doing dual labeling, we we're uh, convinced that clip V really could only see the contracted structure and not the extended structure of the apparatus, uh, which is a great strategy for not disassembling the apparatus prior to uh, it actually firing. Um, so with, with that insight into the structure, uh, we started thinking more and more about what was going on uh, as it was penetrating the cell. And, and could we learn more about the effectors? Were VGRGs the only effectors, or were there other effectors? What types of cells were being affected? And right around uh, the time we were considering all this, uh, Joseph uh, Mougeau first, and then eventually Stefan published that, in fact, you could detect antimicrobial activity uh, due to the type 6 secretion system. And Joseph's group in particular was able to establish that immunity proteins existed that could control the toxic effectors that an organism like Pseudomonas aeruginosa could use uh, to inhibit the growth of an organism like Pseudomonas putida. And Joseph went on to characterize the enzymology of these effector proteins. Two of them are shown on this slide, this TS. 
Uh, E1 is uh, a peptidase or amidase that cleaves uh, these crosslink bonds in peptidoglycan. TSC3 is more of a meramidase cleaving the main glycan chain. And each of these have their cognate immunity proteins, TSI3 and TSI1. It turns out Vibrio's uh, toxic effector was indeed that peptidoglycan lysozyme-like domain, and Brian Ho in the lab and Tao Dong, uh, as well as uh, Stefan Potaski's lab, uh, independently were able to show that this is the, uh, the toxic domain capable of killing E. coli. And, um, and as it turns out, this uh, um, glutamate residue is an essential residue in the active site of this lysozyme-like domain and that inhibits toxicity uh, against E. coli if you mutate it. And finally, TSI3 is the immunity, cognate immunity protein of VGRG3, and is encoded immediately downstream of the structural gene for VGRG3. So Stefan uh, Potaski uh, and colleagues uh, have recently uh, done a, a, a more extensive bioinformatics analysis of the various effectors and all the secretion and all the Vibrio cholera and Vibrio species that have been uh, sequence, and this is a partial list of some of that analysis. Suffice to say that you can recognize uh, plenty of different effectors based upon either enzymatic activities uh, identifiable with bioinformatic analysis, uh, such as peptidoglycan effectors. And in almost every one of these cases, there's an immunity protein, a small uh, protein encoded downstream that are either known to be immunity proteins or, in some cases, uh, uh, are unannotated but are likely to be immunity proteins based upon uh, the putative enzymatic activity. And as it turns out, these are, are heteroimmune, so they're able to show, they were able to show that by cloning some of the putative effectors in the absence or presence of, of different immunity proteins, indeed this uh, protein uh, really is only capable of, of being inhibited in its toxicity with that immunity protein and not with these others. So it's very specific. And now uh, a lot of structural biology coming out from all over the world, Joseph Pujo's lab, uh, several labs in, in uh, China and Korea have also uh, established this paradigm quite clearly that there are multiple different effectors uh, that seem to attack, for example, peptidoglycan at virtually every available linkage. Uh, the small open reading frames downstream from those effectors uh, make proteins that bind uh, very tightly in the active sites of each one of these enzymes, in some cases even dimerizing uh, these enzymes with a single effector molecule, a single immunity molecule. So I think what's emerging out of this work is that if it's so important to control the uh, activity of these enzymes with these immunity proteins, by and large, most of these effector proteins are really targeting uh, prokaryotic cells, and, and therefore the producer cell really has to uh, protect itself from the effectors. There are some exceptions to this. Um, VGRG1, for example, doesn't have uh, a cognate immunity protein, and that makes sense because VGRG1 has an actin cross-linking domain and doesn't seem to be capable of crossing cross-linking any actin-like molecules in prokaryotic cells. So I think what is emerging just from that analysis alone is that this system seems to be uh, very highly specialized for uh, attacking prokaryotic cells, but that's not to say it can't uh, pick up some tricks along the way and start accumulating uh, effectors that have broader activity. I think the biggest category of those is one of the ones we characterize, I won't be talking about today, a lipase that is both toxic uh, for prokaryotic cells as well as eukaryotic cells. Um, but there is going to be specificity as well in ones that hit just eukaryotic targets. So this is a structure, uh, a, um, a crystal structure of uh, the VGRT protein from Pseudomonas aeruginosa, PA0091. And I show you this for two reasons. First of all, to show you that the actual trimeric structure is very compact and tight. Uh, this looks like a, a good weapon to attack uh, a membrane with and insert through it. Uh, there's some channels and other features like this cup domain that might be involved in, in decorating uh, the spike with effectors, and I'll come back to that uh, later. But the other prominent feature that's quite clear is that the tip of this protein actually ends in a very blunt end. And as it turned out, phage uh, orthologs of these trimeric structures have been solved by Peter Lehman's lab. And some of them had very sharp 
chips. And that got Peter wondering if, in fact, we were missing something on this end. So we had a powwow and talked about a variety of different things. But, Mer but uh, uh, Peter's lab was able to show uh, quite convincingly within uh, a very short period of time that T4 had a protein that was referred to as a PAR domain-like protein that, in fact, represented uh, a, a likely uh, extension on the trimeric uh, GP27, GP5 spike. It had about the right size density and, in fact, could be uh, found to associate with the trimeric spike um, when he uh, began to investigate this. So this really prompted us to uh, work with Peter on other PAR motif proteins in type 6 loci, and he developed a wonderful way to uh, allow um, the PAR motif containing proteins in type 6 loci to be studied in the context of hybrid proteins uh, with the GP5 beta uh, prism domain by making uh, fusions of the last few beta uh, strands of the corresponding VGRG proteins. So uh, these structures were solved, and as it turned out, a remarkable structure came out of that. Uh, here's one example. Uh, this is a uh, GP5 fused to a VGRG um, uh, of Vibrio cholera. These are the, the last few strands of the beta helix trimer that uh, forms the blunt end of that spike, and it forms specifically uh, an association with a single uh, copy of the protein uh, 0105, a par, one of, uh, of uh, two pars uh, encoded, well, probably three pars, really, encoded by uh, the Vibrio cholera genome, but two that we studied in detail so far. And uh, as you can see, it forms this extension that's very sharp, so again, the already fairly sharp uh, trimeric structure gets uh, further sharpened uh, by these VGRG um, uh, by these extension proteins on the end of the VGRGs uh, that we call PARs. And we were able to show that, in fact, uh, with um, acinetobacter, a type 6 secretion positive organism that kills E. coli, here are many logs of death of E. coli. Uh, if you knock out type 6, you recover E. coli. In this particular case, you can knock out one PAR, two PARs, but when you knocked out three PARs, you lost killing activity of acinetobacter. And you could complement that triple deletion mutant with a epitope tag version and get back killing activity, so you really only needed one PAR. And that uh, complementing uh, PAR could indeed be secreted into the culture supernatant, uh, consistent with the idea that it was decorating uh, the tip of the corresponding uh, VGRG uh, uh, proteins of that organism. It's also important to note that that kind of complementation not only brings back killing activity, it brings back HCP secretion. So there, everything's consistent with the idea that you need PARs to make this system work very efficiently, uh, whether that's assembly of the apparatus or whether that's really the functionality of that sharp uh, structure at the tip uh, really hasn't been resolved yet because we haven't been able to uh, make mutations that um, allow us to do that yet, although it may be possible. So the repeated PAR sequence, proline, alanine, alanine, arginine, is three times repeated, and that's actually what builds this conical-like structure, uh, a unique fold that represent these conical extensions. And the other things that the type 6 uh, uh, PAR proteins all have is a zinc atom uh, that is uh, embedded near the sharp uh, end of the, of the structure. And, um, while zinc, you know, may be there for uh, hardening or stabilizing the structure, certainly stabilizes the structure, we like to think of this as being sort of a metal hardened tip, if you will, and there may even be possible that, uh, that zinc plays some role uh, as a, uh, as a oxidizing uh, metal uh, in the function of the apparatus as well, I'm trying to understand more about that. Um, but the other thing I wanted to point out is that the carboxy and amino termini uh, of PAR proteins extend and are disordered in these structures, suggesting that these extend away from the fold and could possibly point out into the medium. And this was interesting because uh, Brian Ho in the lab was able to do uh, this uh, bioinformatics analysis and say, what, once we define what a PAR is, where are they out there? And it turns out there's a large number of them that just look like a PAR domain, as best we can tell. But there's 
a larger number of them that have extension domains. And those extension domains can be large and they can be on the carboxy terminus, they can be on the amino terminus, they can be both carboxy and amino terminus. And another feature that a lot of them have is this RHS domain. And notice we never see a PAR that has an RHS domain without an extension domain. And that becomes important as well in a moment, as I'll, I'll tell you more about. So uh, these RHS domains have been found in toxins before, and most recently, Lott had actually solved the structure of an insect toxin that suggested RHS domains form a beta structure that are, are, is analogous to a cage. Uh, we didn't know that this would be the case for, for VGRG, uh, or that carried RHS domains and extensions or PARs that carried these domains, but we found these on enough things that we knew were effectors that we, we had that in mind as a model for how this would work. So this is again an unpublished structure that uh, Peter's lab has generated recently of an RHS domain that shows in fact they do indeed form these beta cages. Uh, this is what it looks like looking on the side, and then if you cut straight through the middle of the cage, you see there's a central cavity inside that cage that is big enough to uh, carry a folded uh, 25 or 30 kilodalton protein. Uh, and that, that largely corresponds roughly to the size of the effector domains that are typically uh, found fused to the RHS domains. So if you go back to PARs and RHSs, you find that uh, the domains that you see as extension domains fall into many categories that are clearly uh, effector-like. A large number of them are identifiable nucleases, both RNA nucleases as well as DNA nucleases, uh, peptidases, lipases, amidases and deamidases, lysozyme-like domains, uh, and a few things that look like eukaryotic toxins. There's also a very big domain there's a protein-protein interaction domain. Another thing you find canonically in this system is you'll find this uh, uh, transthyretin domain fused to things that are clearly effectors. Again, things that look like peptidases and lipases, making us think that the PAR protein brings this protein interaction domain onto the tip of the apparatus, and then this domain recruits uh, effector proteins uh, onto uh, that location. And here's one example of uh, some work uh, coming out of Hayes's lab in collaboration with David Lowe's lab, where they characterized an RHS protein of this organism, uh, Dictia uh, da Dante. And what this particular effector looks like is one of those canonical ones. It's got a PAR domain, it's got an RHS domain, it's got a nuclease domain. And in this paper uh, last year, they were able to show that if you mark uh, target cells, with GFP, so they're green, and you ask whether there's DNA inside them using DAPI, you can show that dependent on this effector, you get degradation of the, of the nucleoid uh, in those target cells. Uh, somewhat consistent, although the time frame is, is pretty long as you see here, uh, but somewhat consistent with the idea that indeed this nuclease domain uh, is likely to be wrapped up in a RHS cage and is decorating a VGRG uh, spike. And more recently, they've actually shown that the delivery of this nucleus domain is indeed dependent on the VGRG, uh, suggesting that uh, a complex likely will be able to be formed between that PAR domain and the uh, dependent VGRG. So what's emerging from this, uh, this story then is the fact that the machine builds a, a spike that's very much like a T4 uh, tail spike. Whereas uh, T4 has lysozyme domains that are fused to the GP5 domain, it may be that these domains are contributed uh, by extension domains of the carboxy terminal end of VGRG proteins. Uh, the PAR uh, structure is further a means of decorating either with caged RG, uh, RHS uh, effectors or other types of effector domains that don't need to be caged but may be controlled by immunity proteins that may be in complex with this structure and perhaps get stripped off uh, at a later date. So this is really uh, our model for that spike being uh, decorated by multiple different effectors. It reminds me a bit of this uh, multiple independent reentry vehicle concept of ballistic missiles, the MIRVs. So we've called it the multiple effector translocation VGRG model. 
to again illustrate that in a single contraction translocation event, it may be possible to deliver multiple different effectors by decorating a warhead, if you will, at the top of the HCP tube with multiple effectors. And this, uh, this just shows you where there's strong evidence of, in fact, these uh, effector proteins being delivered by this mechanism. And I want to be sure to point out that Joseph Mujo's lab uh, has very good evidence, in particular for TSE2, uh, that uh, mechanism number six uh, is likely also true, that some of the lumen, if not all of the lumen, of the uh, HCP2 can be occupied by this particular effector uh, because that effector is chaperoned, if you will, by the internal uh, cavity of the HCP2, uh, uh, which is strong evidence, in fact, that it, it is uh, incorporated into the growing tube and uh, likely uh, that uh, interaction require, is required for delivery of those effectors into target cells. There's actually pretty good evidence of mutational analysis that supports the idea that that interaction is in fact required. But the VGRGs actually get even more complicated as it turns out. I'm just gonna give you one quick example of this. This is work by uh, an ex-postdoc in our lab, Tao Dong, where he was studying uh, VGRG3 and, and expressing it in the cytosol of E. coli and realized that despite the fact that that effector carries a lysozyme-like domain that, that presumably attacks lysozyme, uh, attacks peptidoglycan in the periplasm, uh, it was toxic in E. coli. So he was curious, how did that lysozyme domain get to the periplasm? And uh, because we're in the department of John Beckwith, uh, it, it was obvious that we should try FOA fusions. And indeed, if you take FOA minus its signal sequence, it does not get to the periplasm. But if you replace FOA or make FOA extensions on uh, VGRG3, uh, it has no problem uh, translocating at various efficiencies the, um, the uh, FOA uh, into uh, the, the periplasm where it folds and you get FOA activity here illustrated by blue. So a signal sequence lets FOA fuse the VGRG uh, gets into uh, the periplasm of E. coli. Uh, this, uh, this produces toxicity, as it turns out, and if you knock out the lysozyme uh, uh, critical enzymatic residue, you suppress this toxicity, many logs, so it is dependent on the enzymatic activity of the effector. Uh, the cells round up consistent with lysozyme activity. And if you look further at uh, this domain, uh, right near the peptidoglycan lysozyme domain, what you find is a, uh, a sequence that is uh, somewhat conserved in uh, the other VGRGs of, uh, of Vibrio cholera, suggesting it may be doing something important. And if you run it through the informatics uh, program uh, designed by uh, this group for twin arginine transport signals, you get a lot of yeses here, despite the fact that there is no twin arginine uh, in this uh, canonical sequence. You get strong predicted twin arginine signal. So uh, again, if you go to the uh, Keogh collection of E. coli and start pulling mutants and asking about their relative sensitivity to killing, by VGRG3, when you induce it with a rabinose, you can see uh, in uh, this particular case, I don't have wild type on this slide, but in this particular case, wild type is pretty equivalent to TAT B or TAT C. You get many logs of killing, uh, even in those TAT uh, B and C mutants. But interestingly, TAT A and TAT E uh, suppress uh, toxicity two to three logs. So we think we have a cryptic uh, of sorts twin arginine signal. Uh, that is on uh, the VGRGs. So one of the interesting things about thinking that through then uh, is that uh, this would potentially suggest that when the machine uh, fires uh, this poison dart into the, ta into the target cell, uh, it may not really be slowed down much by the peptidoglycan. It might actually be able to blast right through the entire layer it doesn't envelope layers. It may not need translocation domains to get it through the cytoplasmic membrane. It actually can potentially use protein trafficking of various sorts to move the VGRG uh, effector domain either intact or cleaved off of the VGRG uh, back to the periplasm where it can attack its target. So I think it's another uh, smoking gun, if you will, that this machine is capable of uh, penetrating bacterial cells uh, quite deeply. And I think consistent with that, if you look at the effectors, you see these nucleases, which likely have cytoplasmic targets as well. 
So I want to come back uh, briefly to imaging with clip V because I think this gives us the best way of actually seeing the machine uh, in action uh, in terms of when it's fired its poison dart. And uh, again, reminding you uh, that, that this, uh, this is um, uh, a structure, actually I have this mislabeled. This is uh, VIP, uh, B down here, VIP A down here and VIP B is up there. Um, the, uh, these two proteins form these sheath-like structures, and clip V only jumps on the sheath when it's contracted. And uh, again, work uh, in collaboration with uh, Axel Moog's group uh, has now uh, identified uh, structures uh, that they can study biochemically in great detail, and they've been able to identify that a uh, N-terminal uh, domain of uh, VIP B is actually uh, the recognition domain that clip V uses to disassemble the structure, and that domain is really only exposed based upon their cryo EM reconstructions of uh, this structure and fitting it to a likely fold that would represent the, the uncontracted sheath. Uh, it's only exposed in the contracted sheath, so this would explain the recognition of clip V with that contracted structure. But if you image clip V, uh, you see this incredible dynamic activity occurring regardless of whether you fuse uh, clip V with GFP or M cherry. There's plenty of dynamic activity. If you knock out VIP A, you just get random uh, uh, staining of the cytosol. So what you're imaging then is you're imaging the post-contraction events within probably less than 10 seconds uh, of a contraction event, you'll get a bright spot. So that allows you to then image the ability of something like Vibrio collar to attack E. coli, and you can accumulate a lot of these images uh, and convince yourself that uh, a cell that contracts a single time can deliver a dose of effectors that uh, rounds up and ultimately uh, uh, lyses uh, E. coli in what amounts to uh, a single blow. Uh, so eh, that video didn't run, but. I'll show you this one. Uh, this is, uh, these are three frames. You can see 60 seconds, 90 seconds, and 120 seconds. And in this particular case, this dark cell is E. coli. That bright spot there represents the only contraction that occurred anywhere near this E. coli. And that contraction uh, represents uh, within 10 seconds of the apparatus firing. You can see 30 seconds later, the E. coli starts looking different, somewhat more bulbous and then uh, there's a sudden uh, rounding of the E. coli, and actually you can see some debris that corresponds exactly to where that particular firing event occurred, suggesting that there's been some disruption, maybe mixing of the outer membrane of, of E. coli, of Vibrio cholera with the uh, outer leaflets of uh, the E. coli. But I think this sort of correspondence of debris and the firing and the lysis all suggests that uh, a blow uh, in the range of about a minute is all it takes. One blow in about a minute is all it takes to um, basically uh, round up and, and lysin E. coli. So the apparatus is extraordinarily efficient. And I think you're going to see that again in somewhat sped up in real time right here. There's the shot and there's the lysis. So that's, that's at, uh, I think, 30 times uh, speed. So does that occur in vivo during uh, a host infection? Well. As I was telling uh, students and postdocs that met with me at lunch today, everybody always asks this question. This must be about uh, beating up on the normal flora, the commensals that are in the hosts. Uh, do you have evidence for that? Well, unfortunately, I have to tell you, I don't have evidence that in vivo type 6 is active and kills a heterologous organism. But what I do have is uh, the data of uh, Fu Yang in the lab, and uh, Yang was able to uh, show using a TNSeq analysis that uh, type 6 uh, attack actually occurs in vivo uh, by looking at the result of sister cell analysis. So make a long story short, if you have lots of TN insertions in a population of bacteria, you can move them through a host like an infant rabbit, and then you can measure the abundance of particular insertions. Many insertions don't cause any effect, like the black uh, cells. Some of them have a profound colonization defect, like the green cells, and some of them are virtually colonization defective. 
uh, like the red cells, but you also have some cells like these gray cells that are a minority in the input population but become a majority in the output population. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about uh, that latter case today. They represent these chemotaxis and other uh, interesting uh, targets of small RNAs that are involved in uh, hypercolonization phenotypes. But what I do want to point out is that uh, Yang was able to show that one of the genes in this cluster here, usually I have it labeled TSIV3, was the immunity protein for VGRG3. So this was weird because he did this analysis without going after uh, type 6. Uh, and this particular strain he used doesn't even kill E. coli. It has a type 6 gene cluster, but it's not expressed in vitro. But it, it, it screamed out at us that maybe that immunity protein was defective, so we did the competition experiments. And here's the result. If you mix wild type with a lax Z mutant, they compete with each other one on one in this rabbit model. If you knock out uh, the immunity protein, you get about a two log defect in the immunity mutant. If you knock out the uh, type 6 system in the competing strain, you complement some of that, but not all of it. But if you knock out type 6 in both the competing strain and the wild type uh, immunity mutant, um, you fully uh, complement it back to one on one competition. So uh, we take this as very strong evidence that type 6 is active. It's required for this colonization defect in the immunity mutant. And this uh, indeed suggests that uh, sister cells uh, are attacking sister cells in vivo and that the, and the apparatus is turned on in vivo. Well, I'm not going to show you the data, but we now have clear transcriptional data in the animal model that type 6 is indeed turned on. So uh, along with cholera toxin and TCP, the system gets turned on. Presumably some kind of a biofilm or microcolonies form where sister cells are in close proximity to each other. And if one of those sister cells lacks the immunity protein to this particular effector, they're going to get nailed uh, by their other sisters and get lysed. And that would explain uh, the profound colonization defect is that those cells do not like cheaters where a cheater is defined as a cell that is, uh, is catching a free ride and not uh, expressing an immunity protein. So um, I, I wanted to basically tell you then that this idea that the effectors and the immunity proteins are, are really important uh, for uh, building the apparatus and controlling the apparatus may be only part of the story. The immunity proteins may be just as important because bacteria have learned that they grow in community structures, they grow in microcolonies, and sister cells will be next to sister cells. And if they're going to attack heterologous organisms, they have to have immunity proteins to their own effectors. So they mean more about uh, heterologous attack between cells or, or attack between sister cells in a biofilm than simply protecting uh, the cell that produces the apparatus uh, from the effectors while it's trying to assemble the apparatus. That job may be more important uh, for things like the caged effectors um, where the enzymatic activity of the effector can be controlled during the assembly, but then you still have to have an immunity protein because once it's blasted across into a sister cell, that caged molecule somehow or another is programmed to fall apart maybe under the influence of, uh, of other uh, AAA ATPases that might dissemble it. So uh, finally, I just want to make uh, the final transition to the last topic, and that is do target cells uh, respond to type 6 attack? Now, this is fairly controversial for uh, the microbiology people uh, in the audience. And I apologize that I won't be able to spend too much time on this. But this is one of the surprises we got from uh, this study. What we did was uh, transcriptionally profile the transcriptional response of E. coli to being exposed to Vibrio cholera type 6 positive. And of course, the control here is you compare it to a, a nisogenic Vibrio cholera that's type 6 negative. And as it turns out, we've also looked at its effect, various effectors as well. And suffice to say, the one uh, off the chart gene that was uh, induced. Um, by being mixed uh, with uh, a type 6 positive Vibrio cholera is this SOXS gene, which I think you, many of you will recognize is, uh, is a, a gene that responds to uh, oxidative stress. Now, I'm sorry if the lights uh, make this difficult to see, but this is again showing you a SOXS GFP reporter 
You can see there's a large number of E. coli cells here that are green. If you knock out one of the uh, structural components of the apparatus, very few, one or two here or there, but quantitating this, uh, many times we've uh, convinced ourselves that if this is an indication of ROS stress, induction of this gene, it indeed uh, is induced about 15-fold by being mixed with a type C positive organism. And then, because this is such a phage-like structure, we ask the question, you know, do, is this possible that this is uh, true for phages as well? And indeed, when we use uh, P1 phage in E. coli or an antibiotic that hits the outer membrane, polymyxin, uh, we see largely the same result. So in this particular case, full change of uh, the SOXS uh, uh, reporter. Um, in this case, I think this is actually um, uh, RNA being measured. Strong induction, about 15-fold. You can also use uh, fluorescence reporters here when you mix it with P1-Vir. The whole field becomes bright, brightly uh, fluorescent. Here's the control with no phage. And, and if you mix it with polymyxin, again, you get uh, induction. And if you go with fluorescent dyes and measure directly uh, reactive oxygen, you get strong induction with uh, these agents uh, and far less with uh, untreated or other types of controls. So I think a take-home lesson here, whether we like it or not, and I'm not that happy with this result, is that the attack of the type 6 apparatus, perhaps phage, is able to perturb something in the envelope that ultimately can generate ROS. It oxidizes SOX-R, SOX-R activates the transcription of SOX-S, and to some extent, you get a redox stress response. Now, the obvious question is, does this have any consequence uh, for the survival? I'm not sure, I don't think I have that slide in, but we've, we've gone and asked that question by using uh, heterologous expression of SOX-S and we get about a tenfold better survival of E. coli uh, when mixed with Vibrio collar if we overexpress TOXS uh, in the population. So if you pre-activate the downstream genes, you get some resistance. You still get logs of killing, but there are multiple effectors that Vibrio collar is delivering, and I'm not sure uh, what stress response genes might protect, but they're clearly seeing some ROS and that being responsible for some of the killing associated with type 6. So hard to know, but there's been some uh, speculation in the field that many different antibiotics and chemical compounds and host immune proteins such as uh, uh, perforin and, and, uh, and complement components uh, can generate ROS when you measure it. So it may be that a lot of things that disrupt the envelope of gram-negative cells can generate uh, an oxygen stress response. And by the way, it's not hydrogen peroxide in case Anybody who was curious about that, it does, there's no evidence that uh, OxyR is induced by these systems. Uh, now, Pseudomonas aeruginosa also responds uh, to, to the attack, and as it turns out, uh, this is manifested by this amazing sister cell, sister cell activity, where one uh, cell uh, spontaneously fires the apparatus and immediately a second cell nearby, the point of attack uh, of the apparatus, uh, responds with a counterattack, uh, again, work uh, first observed and, and published by Merrick Bassler in the lab. This is clip V, so you're seeing the uh, a few seconds after the apparatus presumably fired, uh, you see these counterattacks within seconds by uh, sister cells at exactly that anatomical site. Uh, so we call this type 6 dueling, and we wondered whether uh, this sort of sister cell, sister cell attack was manifesting uh, a, a a response to heterologous type 6 cell attacks. And to make a long story short, that turned out to be the case. If we mix Vibrio cholera here red with Pseudomonas aeruginosa here green, you can see the red cells dominate. The, the Pseudomonas occasionally have some sister cell, sister cell attacks going on. But by and large, the Vibrios are not affected by being together with the Pseudomonas. But if you now use a Vibrio cholera that's not negative, you use one that is positive for type 6, now, Pseudomonas aeruginosa aggressively attacks the Vibrio cholera. They start rounding up, and wherever you see the arrows, they're, they're lysing. And within a relatively short period of time, Pseudomonas aeruginosa dominates. So we've characterized this system. This is really the work of several people in the field defining the various components, but for the sake of brevity today, 
Um, this signal transduction system, which includes an outer membrane lipoprotein, a per periplasmic protein that associates with it, and some inner membrane proteins that ultimately uh, activate a kinase, uh, is thought to trigger phosphorylation of a protein called FHA, which drives assembly of the apparatus. And then a phosphatase called PPPA that Joseph Mijot characterized in the lab takes off that phosphate group and that presumably inactivates the apparatus. If you now reanalyze these components in light of uh, the sister cell dueling and the other uh, phenomenon that I'm talking about, basically if you knock out the kinase, you never assemble the apparatus, everything just stays green. If you knock out these intermembrane components that activate the kinase, you still assemble the ap apparatus spontaneously but it, um, you get no sister cell dueling, so no response to the apparatus. If you knock out the phosphatase, you get activity of the apparatus in all the cells, but there effectively is no dueling response. So there's nothing wrong with building the apparatus if you, uh, you get a phosphorylated FHA, you actually accumulate lots of apparati, and they stay pretty much focused where they were initially built, uh, but you don't get dueling responses. And finally, if you mix it together with a heterologous target that's type 6 positive, when you do all the controls of type 6 negative targets or these uh, sensory, uh, the sensory systems, the TAG system or the kinases or the FHAs, you see that you get about two logs more efficient killing of a type 6 positive target if this sensory response uh, is completely intact. So we call this the tip for tap model. Um, because uh, basically pseudomonas will coexist with an organism if it doesn't attack it, but uh, if it senses attack, it quickly uh, has all the components already pre-synthesized. It, it understands where the attack has occurred through that signal transduction machinery I just described. It builds a counterattack and quickly attacks rapidly multiple times uh, at the location of the initial attack, and this leads to very efficient killing of the, uh, the aggressive uh, attacking cell. And then something, presumably the loss of any further attacks of this sort, uh, ultimately leads to the disassembly of the apparatus using the CLIP-V uh, cycle. And as it turns out, this ability to sense attack goes beyond type 6. Uh, very briefly, conjugation works as well. The type 4 secretion system, which mediates conjugation, uh, also is detected by the type 6 uh, system so that you get uh, really three logs more killing of E. coli if it carries a conjugated plasmid like RP4 or this plasmid KM101. Um, that, that killing activity is totally dependent on type 6, so again, just the mere act of trying to form a conjugation bridge using a type 4 apparatus uh, is sensed by Pseudomonas and it counterattacks uh, the organism trying to do that. And uh, indeed, when you do the genetic analysis of this, uh, it turns out that the sex pillus mating pair formation or any component in the type 4 secretion system is required for that counterattack. You do not need DNA transfer in this case. You can knock out the relaxase or the coupling protein, TRA-T. In fact, when you knock out DNA transfer, they are hypersensitive to getting killed uh, by type 6 of Pseudomonas, still dependent, though, on these other components. So I think uh, the, the mating pair formation, the bridge, if you will, between a mating cell and a, and a target cell is actually made more efficiently if it's not slowed down by engaging uh, the DNA transfer machinery. So we call this transfer-associated patterns to try to make an analogy to a bacterial innate immune system. Uh, it's conceivable that this is there to block uh, transfer of uh, parasitic elements like plasmids, perhaps even phages under the right conditions. Um, but uh, you know, showing that was key, and we were able to show about a 12-fold reduction in plasmid transfer into Pseudomonas aeruginosa if this system is entirely intact uh, and functional. So it may actually be an immunity system for infection with, these, with, these, uh, with the elements. So again, you might ask the question, what's the TAP signal? What's the type 6 triggering signal? I think I've gone over all these. Uh, we think it's an outer membrane perturbation simply because polymyxin B induces a dramatic activation of the system. I'll fire this. This is as fast as we can get cells down on an auger pad with polymyxin. Whoops, I'm sorry. You can see this 
sweep of type 6 activity that goes through the population. Every Pseudomonas aeruginosa fires up and then calms down, primarily because I think ATP is depleted in the cell and polymyxin is toxic for uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So if you temporally code this with color, you can see uh, as fast as we can add the cells uh, to the agar pad, you get this burst of type 6 activity and then a calming down over the next few seconds. It takes about 60 seconds to get maximum activity in the population. And by comparison, wild type cells without polymyxin, only the occasional cell has activity and it's usually associated with pairs of cells that are dueling, as it turns out. So once again, we know uh, that type 4, type 6, polymyxin all work through this system. And uh, suffice to say that uh, I just told you before that phage attack and uh, type 6 attack and polymyxin can also generate some ROS signals inside uh, Pseudomonas origin, uh, I'm sorry, inside target cells like E. coli. We have not investigated, but we're in the process of trying to find out if maybe some kind of an ROS system signal associated with perturbation of maybe the cytochrome chain or something might also be talking in some way to the signal transduction cascade to activate uh, the apparatus. But if that's the case, it's a very localized signal uh, that may occur when these uh, elements attack the outer membrane. So finally, a few uh, last conclusions. I think uh, uh, it's fair to say that we know that type 6 gene clusters in Pseudomonas aeruginosa are, are strongly induced uh, in human cystic fibrosis lung. This is based on RNA-seq analysis of bacteria recovered from, uh, from uh, lavages of uh, such patients. We also know that if you mix Pseudomonas aeruginosa with the sputum uh, of a CF patient, you get uh, dramatic transcriptional upregulation of type 6. Uh, and then finally, we know CF patients actually immunologically respond uh, to uh, the components of type 6. All this is consistent with this organism uh, expressing, at least transcriptionally, uh, the type 6 system in vivo. And uh, we just uh, did an analysis of Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the lung of uh, mice. Uh, this is a mouse lung model, and what is shown here is uh, TNC-seq analysis, and on a log scale, wherever you see very tall bars, it represents uh, insertions that have shown a very profound defect in colonization in the, system, in the uh, mouse lung. And as you can see, there's a strong signal here, a strong signal here, and a strong signal here. These are the three uh, type 6 loci of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we're accumulating evidence that type 6 is apparently a bona fide virulence factor in Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the context of a model like this, certainly seemed to be expressed in the lung of cystic fibrosis patients. It's well known or, or assumed that a, a solid bi biofilm of, of Pseudomonas aeruginosa is forming in uh, the lungs of these patients. So whether this represents um, signaling uh, associated with sister cell sister cells or uh, components that disrupt the outer membrane of Pseudomonas that are host factors like defensins or uh, cryptins or other uh, oxidative uh, products of uh, inflammatory cells, it's all open. Uh, and then one wonders, uh, how do you get this benefit in vivo? Is that benefit uh, attributable to affecting a host function, like the function of macrophages or inflammatory cells, or is that a benefit associated with suppressing uh, other organisms, other gram-negative flora, for example, that may be trying to co-colonize the niche that Pseudomonas aeruginosa is occupying? Uh, finally, I wanted to just mention the work of Bill Robbins in the lab. He's been doing more RNA-seq analysis in vivo. He, sh he too sees very strong induction uh, in the mouse model and, as I said, in the rabbit model. And this induction, which again is shown here by the height of these bars that align to the type 6 region, are now starting to correlate with the emergence of more pathogenic, more infectious strains. And this is uh, the Haitian strain H1 showing very strong induction of the type 6 loci, whereas a very closely related earlier strain from a couple of decades back, uh, either uh, Bangladesh in 1970 or Peru in 1991, really this region is silent. And this is one of the only major transcriptional changes in these organisms. So 
I think we're starting to see the stage set that type 6 is, is an evolutionary adaption that's really making a difference in the evolutionary fitness of these organisms and whether these sorts of phenotypes are, are about killing competitors in vivo or killing host cells that are responding to the colonization process uh, remains to be seen with much more sophisticated uh, kinds of experimental approaches. So I want to end by saying I firmly believe now that type 6 really resides in here. I might change the Venn diagram a little bit and make the bacterial target targets uh, much larger uh, than, um, than the uh, eukaryotic targets, but nonetheless we have a system that seems to be uh, capable of targeting both eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. Surprisingly, we have no evidence that they target gram-positive cells, and I like to joke around with people and say that's why we have gram-positive cells. But I'd love to hear uh, from the evolutionary biologists about uh, that statement as to whether uh, gram positives are just simply uh, resistant to uh, this sort of uh, attack as an adaptive uh, process. So type 6 works with both. It's expressed in vivo. It affects the colonization process, perhaps by uh, interacting with commensals. And finally, our hope is that by understanding more about these type 6 interactions, we might be able to apply this knowledge the development of new therapeutics, be they interventions, uh, if they are virulence factors, or alternatively, uh, possibly uh, ways of making new probiotics that can eliminate um, uh, bad pathogenic members of our commensal flora or primary pathogens of various sorts. So I think I mentioned everybody's names and showed a lot of pictures, so I'm not going to go over all these names again, but I'm very thankful for all. Uh, the fantastic postdocs and students that have worked on this project through the years, fantastic collaborators, uh, a big uh, uh, call out to Peter Lehman in Luzon, who's been a wonderful structural biologist collaborator in our studies, and many other contributors that have passed through the lab through the years. And here's just associating faces with, uh, with names in the lab and some of the names I mentioned today. So thank you again very much. Okay. We have time for a few questions before the reception, which will be in the library. If you have a question, please go to the microphone, and we'll keep it relatively, yeah. Hi, yeah, I was wondering if um, you had looked at the transcriptional activation of a cell that received a type 6 attack but was able to survive, like these sister-sister um, pairings. It just, when yeah. you... When you presented the data, it looked a lot like all of these different quorum sensing systems at the same time that, you know, perhaps these cells are interacting with each other on very close, like, are you my neighbor, are you like me yeah. kind of system. So that's a, that's a really uh, great question, and we've had some difficulty in sort of addressing it at the level that I think you would find, you know, the answer satisfying. The way we've tried to do it is we've tried to... Um, play games with transcriptionally profiling, at least, uh, cells that either had an active type 6 secretion system and had the immunity proteins for it, or ones that didn't. And these are cells that are both uh, recovered from broth culture, as well as cells that have been interacting with each other on an auger plate to see if we see any differences. And the remarkable thing that you see is very few differences. But they do respond, and they respond in, in, in a couple of interesting ways. One thing that you do see is you see, in general, the steady state level of envelope stress responses is up if you have an active type 6. If you hyperactivate it, for example, by using the phosphatase mutant, it's way up. So I think, I think that probably could be a signal uh, from the producer cell, just the act of building the apparatus and firing it through the cell walls producing envelope stress, but we can't completely satisfactory uh, differentiate it from the possibility that that's a response of a sister cell under attack by an adjacent aggressive sister. It's still tricky. Once you start playing around with immunity proteins, though, all bets are off and you start getting uh, all kinds of other stress responses that are probably associated with the effect of the effectors. The other thing that we've seen is, um, is a strong derepression of the effectors themselves. So that, that is a weird phenomenon that's different for different organisms. So for example, in Pseudomonas, uh, let's, let's go with Vibrio cholera. With Vibrio cholera, uh, uh, Flor uh, Caro in the lab 
has nice data. Uh, Tao Dong also has independent data in another strain background that if you knock out uh, the type 6 apparatus, so the, the apparatus is not functional, the cell recognizes that you can't build an effective apparatus and it upregulates the, uh, the effector components. So the VGRGs, the, uh, the components that really we know about as effectors, even ones that are not fused to VGRG like the lipase, um, these are all upregulated uh, and some other ones. So, so it's almost as if the cell is saying, if the apparatus is not built and I'm accumulating effectors that aren't getting secreted, I know it's not working properly so maybe I need to make more effectors or something like that. It's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a hypothesis we have to pursue more. So, you know, quorum sensing certainly has been implicated in some of the expression of type 6 and other systems. I wouldn't be surprised if there's multiple layers of regulation, both transcriptionally and post-transcriptionally. Maybe we should uh, reconvene at the reception. For further happy discussion, to, happy to talk which to will be right there. across yep. the hall in the library. Okay. Thank you, Thank you again.